Sri Lanka's most powerful news brand. Bringing you the latest news from around the world and here at home, I'm Sandro Ferdinando. Before we head into our stories in detail, let's start off with a look at the headlines. SLFP and joint opposition in talks of possible merger. Fundamental rights petition filed by Shanil Nithikumara dismissed by Supreme Court. Gotabe Rajapaksa requests court to prevent action being taken against him under the Public Property Act. Civil organizations filed bribery case against energy mafia. The Sri Lanka Freedom Party and the joint opposition have reportedly held talks at the parliamentary complex today. News First parliamentary correspondent reported that Anupriya Dashanayapa and Lasantali Gewanna had attended this meeting from the SLFP, while C.B. Ratnayaka, Mahindiyapa and Pavitravani Arachi had represented the joint opposition. Our correspondent said following this meeting, the parliamentary group of the joint opposition has convened. We set the foundation for both sides to sit down for talks. If there is any split in the village level, that will not benefit our future programs. Therefore, we have set the foundation for the discussions to take place. No, I will not overestimate or underestimate anything. We need to understand the reality and act accordingly. There is no issue with them. In any country, institution or party, it is the leadership that needs to take the final decision. The agreement the SLFB inked has reached its end. We have extended it until December based on the request of the President. I believe the decision will have to be taken by the party. We will have to decide after the agreed time frame ends to say if we will agree or not. There's a few more days. We cannot join with a party that is in an alliance with the United National Party. We have been leading an anti-government movement, so how can we join the government we opposed? If we establish an alliance with a group in the government, we will also be a part of it. What we propose is that we will consider if they are ready to join with us. It is not about forming an alliance with them. If they are willing to leave the UNP, we might consider. We'd like to tell Mahindra Rajapaksa not to fall in the same pit he fell into before. I can clearly say if Mahindra Rajapaksa joins, this will be the third disaster he will have to face. The petition filed by Gota Be Rajapaksa at the Court of Appeals seeking an order to prevent action being taken against him under the Public Property Act was taken up for consideration today. The bench comprising Chairman of the Court of Appeal, LTB Dehim Benier, and Justice Shiran Gunratna reserved for tomorrow's whether to issue a writ of mandamus as requested in the petition. In his petition, Gota Biraj Paksa says facts have been presented to court under the Public Property Act, charging that public funds had been misappropriated for the construction of the DA Rajapaksa Memorial Museum. The museum had been constructed as per an agreement reached between the DA Rajapaksa Foundation and the Sri Lanka Land Reclamation and Development Corporation. The petitioner says an assistant superintendent of police had produced a certificate to court certifying the funds were those that come under the Public Property Act and requests court to issue a writ of mandamus quashing that certification. If any injustice is caused to Gotabe Rajapaksa, the hundreds of thousands retired servicemen and the general public will be moved to the streets. The government must be prepared for that. 
The fundamental rights petition filed by Shanil Nitikumara to prevent an imminent arrest was dismissed by the Supreme Court today. Nitikumara is alleged to have threatened the family of a witness who testified before the Bond Commission. A written complaint was made to the Presidential Commission of Inquiry citing on the 14th of October 2017, Shanil Nitikumara had called the mobile of Vijita Vijay Surya, the brother of Anika Vijay Surya, and made debt threats. Anika Vijay Surya testified before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry in July this year. Following the complaint being made, the Commission had directed the matter to the CID that probable offences under the Penal Code and Protection of Victims of Crime and Witnesses Act have taken place and action should be taken accordingly. Thereby, the Criminal Investigations Department conducted an inquiry and reported facts via a B report to the Fort Magistrates Court on the 26th of October 2017. The B report says Vijita Vijay Surya had recorded a conversation where Nitti Kumara threatened him using another mobile phone. News First is in possession of a conversation which is said to be the one between Vijay Surya and Nitti Kumara. <laughs> I will, you know, Vijita tells you all the f***ing Sorry? What is it to uncle? I will go and f***ing Yeah, for that. You will what? I will not tell you all this. I will, what you all did to my uncle, mother. Yeah. Uh, you know, mother, in 2001, mother, you uncle, you were a father, mother, in the post. But what you all did, I thought you were my friend. So now, mother, I will play. Open it in you, and you will open it. Don't get caught with me because I definitely with the bottle. All of you. Okay, so I finally. Don't get caught, Matthew. Don't get caught with me. I'll. Don't get caught with me, Matthew. You all made 600 million rupees from Uncle Ali's apartment complex. Now, Matthew, let's play the game. I'm going to be careful, huh? I will tell you again. It was reported Shanil Nettikumara was informed by the CID on several occasions to provide a statement. However, Nettikumara had failed to appear. Nitti Kumara, who did not appear before the magistrate's court, filed a petition with the Supreme Court through his attorneys requesting that any attempt to arrest him be prevented. He was not present in the Supreme Court today as well. Attorney at law Salia Piris, who appeared on behalf of the petitioner, said on the day when the alleged threat was made, an altercation had taken place between Vijay Surya and Nitti Kumara, who were friends at the time. Senior Additional Solicitor General Viraj Daratna said, Nitti Kumara is a fugitive and he cannot seek special treatment from court. The petition was taken up before Supreme Court Justices Eva Vanasundara, Bhuvanika Alvihare and Anil Gunaratna. The petition filed by Shanil Nitti Kumara to prevent an imminent arrest was dismissed as it had no basis. When the bond scam happened in February 2015, we reported, News First reported on the matter during the first week of March in the same year. To be exact, the 8th of March 2015 was the day we reported on the bond scam. When we reported on it, uh, no one here or the no people in our country did not know the severity of the bond scam. Day by day, when we revealed information, everyone understood the severity and the extent to which the bond scam has affected the country and our economy. To understand that topic really well, we had to sought the help of experts in the financial sector and even in the legal sector. We spoke to them and we asked them what this bond scam was and how it is a problem to the country. We have come to a situation where we have to once again seek the advice and the support of the experts when we are talking about the Foreign Exchange Act Number no. 12 of 2017. This is the new Foreign Exchange Act certified on the 12th of July 2017. The regulations pertaining to this act came into effect on the 17th of November this year. We revealed the severity of the bond scam one day by day and then the Presidential Commission of Inquiry was also appointed and more details pertaining to the bond scam came out there as well. Now, as I told you, the date certified, this act has been certified on the 28th of July 2017. There are 46 members in the cabinet, including the president and the prime minister. This piece of legislation has to go as a draft before the cabinet and it has to receive the approval of the cabinet. Then this draft can be challenged by anyone at the Supreme Court and to check whether this draft or this piece of legislation is in accordance with the constitution of our country. Then there's of course the parliament with 225 members. This has to then come to the legislature where this type of laws 
are put into the system and then this becomes the law after the speaker puts his signature on it. If this act has points in it that are severe, that are problematic, why did this not go through each of these stages at the cabinet? Why wasn't it pointed out? At uh, no, why didn't anyone take it to the Supreme Court? Why didn't the parliamentarians, the 225 parliamentarians who discussed this matter, not know what was in the act if this is this problematic? Now, several uh, mistakes, wrongdoings identified in the previous act, the Exchange Control Act that was before this act, have now been turned into uh, acts of uh, civic value. They, are, they, they do not entail any criminal charges. Once again, another point that is important is that according to this Foreign Exchange Act, the minister in charge of the central bank of our country is the minister in charge of foreign exchange. Currently, the minister in charge of the central bank is the prime minister of our country, Honorable Ranil Vikramasinghe. Several people express their concerns over the Foreign Exchange Act uh, over the days, and this is the leader of the Janata Vimukti Paramuna, the JVP, Andhra Kumar Disanayaka. Ravi Karuna Nayak is facing an allegation on fraud that surrounds foreign exchange. This case was brought forward during the previous administration. We are aware there were certain agreements that were reached. I state this with responsibility. That forced the continuous postponement of this case. It transpired that former Minister Ravi Karuna Nayaka had acted in violation of the regulations of the Ministry of Finance. That is the case. However, what happened in the end? The person who acted in violation of the regulations of the Ministry of Finance was appointed at the Ministry of Finance. After that, Ravi Karunanayaka becomes the defendant. An official from the Ministry of Finance presents facts. The case clearly notes Ravi Karunanayaka will be released and not acquitted. The Attorney General's Department says a case can be refiled. A case cannot be filed only if the person is released and acquitted. But he has not been acquitted of that charge. The case was rejected based on certain technicalities. However, there is provision to refile the case. But on the 25th of July 2017, an amendment is made to the Exchange Control Act and that was presented by Ravi Karunanayaka as the Finance Minister. He includes regulations where the wrongs that were committed were made right and it affects the acts of the past. This act was produced and passed in Parliament to save oneself from a case filed against one. <laughs> Like the leader of the JVP, Andhra Kumar Disanayaka, several other people also raised concern over this new Foreign Exchange Act number 12 of 2017. There were several stages that this act has to go through as a draft before it received the approval to become a part of the law of our land. Now, did they not know what was inside this act when it was being discussed? The 46 members of the cabinet, the 225 members of parliament, did they not know what was included? or the severity of this act before it uh, came in to be a part of the law of our country and when it was a draft. Now, we remember there are previous examples set by various governments in our country. Uh, best example would be the 19th Amendment, how they tried to discreetly put in statements that would regulate the media. When we as a media institution went before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled that if the government decides to put in regulations of this matter, there should be a public referendum to seek the public referendum and to make those changes. So there are examples where statements, clauses have been uh, swept in discreetly for various purposes by various governments. So why did this act not go before the Supreme Court when it was a draft? Whatever said and done, there are uh, mistakes, wrongdoings identified in the previous act. Uh, and according to this new act, these uh, wrongdoings have to be looked into by these uh, legal authorities and cases must be filed within six months. Is this practical with our legal system that is uh, functioning in our country with all the laws delays? Six months, the time frame, is it enough to actually look into all the uh, details, all the facts regarding a certain case and to file cases against this? However, the Foreign Exchange Act number 12 of 2017, certified on the 28th of July 2017, is now in effect. And all we can ask is the people and the people who are responsible, the Parliament or the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, to take the necessary action. There is no issue at all because even the constitution can be repealed and repealing is a very necessary provision of law. Because all laws need to be repealed because you have to bring it contemporary and also relevant. 
to the, to the passing of time. With passing of time, it must be made adjustable so that it keeps to the needs of society. So therefore, this act can also be amended. And there is further proof, as I can see in Section 30 of the Foreign Exchange Act, Chapter 423 is in fact repealed by this Act. 423 repeals it and the words are very simple. All you have to say is such and such an Act is repealed. It can be the whole Act, part of the Act or certain provisions in the Act. So you can safeguard the provisions and some other provisions but repeal the main Act. And this is necessary because this particular Act has absolutely weird provisions that are very detrimental and harmful to the economy of Sri Lanka. This is a, an act that can be called a hitman's act, an economic hitman act is this. Bitcoin has finally passed the $10,000 per coin level and has had stunning years supported by growing mainstream adoption and massive trading volume. Currently, the cryptocurrency is up by 800% compared to the beginning of the year when it was priced at $968 per coin. Bitcoins are electronic currency, otherwise known as cryptocurrency. Bitcoins are a form of digital public money that is created by painstaking mathematical computations and policed by millions of computer users called miners. Bitcoins are, in essence, electricity converted into long strings of code that have money value. The latest price surge brought Bitcoin's market capitalization to more than $214 billion. Meanwhile, the total estimated value of all cryptocurrencies surged to $401.9 billion. Welcome back to the news. President Maitripala Sirisena, who is on a three-day official visit to South Korea, met with President Moon Jae-in. The President's media unit reported that prior to the official meeting, which is scheduled for tomorrow, President Sirisena was welcomed by his counterpart in South Korea, President Moon Jae-in. As part of the first event in his visit, President Sirisena visited the Joggyesa Temple in Seoul, an ancient Korean Buddhist shrine, this afternoon. It was a significant event as the South Korean President Moon Jae-in also participated along with President Sirisena. During this event, the South Korean President pointed out that many diplomatic relations between Sri Lanka and the Republic of Korea will take place in the near future. President Sirisena expressed his gratitude in paying respects to the Sarvakya Datu relics in the Joggyesa temple that was placed by Anagarika Dharmapala back in 1913. The expenditure of the Ministries of Disaster Management Ports and Shipping, as well as the Ministry of Labor, Trade Union Relations and Sabaragama Development were debated in Parliament today. The Hambantha report was sold and the situation is such that no vessel come there. There are 458 workers and for the past seven days their parents were engaged in a fast unto death. What will happen to these workers? We were informed these workers are to be let go by the 30th. The port is in Hambantota and we as the youth from Hambantota will not allow any Chinese firm to enter Hambantota until the jobs of the 438 workers are secured and proper compensation is given. We will definitely do that by force, by protesting and even by bringing the whole of Hambantota to the streets. In order to give permanent employment to 248 people, I have not even given letters to any person. We have made a proposal for the 464 workers in question. We will give them compensation and if they agree, we can give them an employment opportunity at the Magampura port. We have spoken with the Chinese firm and informed them. The compensation must be increased as per the labor regulations. We made them agree to provide them compensation which is three times more than what is given under the labor regulations of the country. They can obtain the compensation and have a job. So what is the issue? China merchant the agreement was signed to make amends to the loan installment that we must make to China merchants' port holdings. But you have paid another loan installment even after signing that agreement in August. So, what was the basis to make that payment? Although the agreement was signed, the transfer comes into effect on the day when the agreement comes into effect. 
Six months have been given and the period ends on the 28th of January. We are preparing to make the first week of December the period in which that agreement will come into effect. The transfers goes to two Sri Lankan companies and 22 million US dollars have been paid as loan installments. Before making that payment, I went to cabinet and told them after the agreement is signed, we have a responsibility to make the temporary payment before the agreement comes into force. Cabinet approval was obtained for that. According to the budget, he says international shipping lines will be able to come here and obtain 100% stake. The reasons given are to bring more international shipping lines to the country and you must do a study on that. All the international shipping lines come to Sri Lanka and you do not need millions of dollars to build a shipping corporation. You only need 5 million Sri Lankan rupees and thereafter you can open an office to provide the services. So you are casting aside all the local businessmen to simply bring 5 or 10 million rupees. The shipping agents are the local businessmen. There are around 500 of them in the country. They have made good profits during this time and those funds are invested in Sri Lanka. They do not take it abroad. When the situation was such, there was sudden proposal to open it 100%. We did not know until you mentioned that to us. Today I speak against it not only as Mahinda Samarasinghe, not only as a Minister of Ports and Shipping, I am speaking from the Selepi point of view. I spoke to the President and told him that this cannot be allowed. I am aware of who is steering this. For the second time, it was the papers mentioning the names of several other countries. Why can't this be opened? Should public funds be invested twice? Do we not have any other topics to discuss? It is I who decide whether to issue that gazette or not. We make it clear that there will be no change. <laughs> There is no need to suddenly destroy this. We must first discuss the matter with shipping agents. Their issues must be looked into. Ministers Mangala and Mahinda will have a discussion and take a decision. That is what I propose. A group of workers attached to the Central Expressway, which is under construction, staged a protest today, citing the danger in the safety standards at their work environment. A worker attached to the Central Expressway died after being electrocuted yesterday. Our correspondent reported that following this incident, a group of workers staged a protest from Kadavata to Keravalapitiya along the expressway. They raised their concerns that the Chinese nationals involved in the project are neither familiar with English nor Sinhala and hence in the event of an emergency they are helpless. The worker in question who suffered electrocution was kept at the site for more than 30 minutes because there was no emergency service at the site. It took 45 minutes to take the individual that was electrocuted to the hospital. The Chinese nationals here do not understand us. Minister of Megapolis and Western Development Patali Chambhika Ranavaka launched the Beira Lake Intervention Area Development Plan yesterday. The plan aims to restore the Beira Lake and turn it into the scenic tourist and leisure park by 2035. News First, Chaturang Haparachi has more details. Some say politics in our country stink. Is politics the only thing that stinks in Colombo? This body of water that you see behind me also starts releasing a bad odour after the rainy season. The government, through its budget, promised a blue-green economy. Will the government be able to tackle the environmental problems surrounding the Bere Lake in the coming years? The proposed zoning plan of the Urban Development Authority has been titled the Ran Masupura Project. The financial support to the proposed zoning plan will be provided by the World Bank. The plan proposes to develop lands in the immediate vicinity of Berry Lake for hotels and tourism activities. Lands located near Vauxhall Street are to accommodate a leisure park for the public. While the project will be carried out in five phases, the first and the second phase of the project has been estimated to incur a cost of 500 million rupees and 600 million rupees respectively. The first phase of relocating people from the Vauxhall Street area has already begun. We are now at an area in Vauxhall where people have been asked to evacuate by the 30th of this month. 
People living here say that they have been living for over 50 years in the area and that they want proper housing facilities if they are to move. People living in Ekasi Hatta Pahawatta and Asu Hatavatta in Vauxhall Street have been relocated to the Henamulla camp area in Colombo 15. The minister speaking at the launch of the event said that the Prime Minister and the President has allocated 1,300 million rupees for the relocation program of the people. The case filed against the former chairman of the Akurasa Pradesh Sabha, Saru Alenage Sunil, for raping an underage girl was taken up at the Kalambu High Court today. Yesterday, the prosecution informed court they will present the video footage in question to court today. Our correspondent reported following a court order issued yesterday, the video footage of the incident in question were played in court. The Attorney General filed indictments against the suspects for forcibly taking away the daughter of a couple working under him and raping her. Making the illustrated headlines tonight is our resident cartoonist Asanga Ladwehetti. Following the news tonight, a special edition of Viz in Focus looks at Sri Lanka's progress on the UN Sustainable Development Goals with the UN Resident Coordinator Una Macaulay and Rich Sunakan, UNFPA Representative and Country Director. And with that, we wrap up primetime news for the News First team. I'm Sandro Ferdinando. And I'm Azra Hassan. Take care and good night.